Texas and Oklahoma provide another exhilarating Red River showdown. Soccer continued conference play against Iowa State and another week of mayhem in the NFL. All this and more coming up on College Press Box. Good evening and welcome to College Press Box. I'm Tommy Yarsh alongside Jason Kanander and we've got another great show coming your way. Let's start off at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas where Texas and Oklahoma faced off for the 117th Red River Showdown. Here we go, taking a look at highlights from last Saturday. We'll start off in the first quarter. The first play of the game, actually, Casey Thompson connects with the freshman, Xavier Worthy, and he takes off 75 yards on the opening play of the opening drive for a touchdown. 7-0 Texas lead early. They're going to keep that momentum going. Who else? The Heisman runner, B. John Robinson, two-yard touchdown, makes it 14-0 Texas. But we know the Oklahoma offense is high-powered, and starting quarterback Spencer Rattler dives in on the next possession, making it 14-7. Texas second quarter Rattler goes to the bench and in comes the true freshman Caleb Williams a 66 yard touchdown run that makes it 28 to 14 to Texas Sooners showing some life but Spencer Rattler comes back into the game and fumbles it Texas falls on it 28 to 17 in midway through the second quarter still in the second B. John Robinson once again and just take a look at him work a big stiff arm there from Robinson, and he goes for 50 yards down to the two-yard line. On the very next play on the same drive, Casey Thompson over the middle. That's Jared Wiley coming down with the touchdown. That makes it 35-17 to Texas. Fourth quarter, though, whole different story. OU down by a possession, a deep ball, and what a grab by Marvin Mims, an unhuman-like catch. That ties it up at 41 after Spencer Rattler comes in for the two-point conversion, and then Oklahoma takes their first lead of the game after trailing by 21 thanks to a Kennedy Brooks touchdown from 18 yards out. But Casey Thompson and company aren't done yet. Xavier Worthy with another big touchdown late in the fourth quarter, tied up at 48, and then in the dying seconds, Kennedy Brooks from 33 yards out says that's game. Oklahoma wins it 55 to 48 in a heartbreaking loss for the Longhorns. Let's take a look at the stat sheet. Casey Thompson 20 for 34 with 388 yards and five touchdowns. Five touchdowns tied for the most throwing touchdowns from a quarterback in Red River history. And some of those touchdowns went to Xavier Worthy. You saw 261 yards from him and two touchdowns. And then Bijan Robinson, another big day for the Heisman candidate. 137 yards on 20 carries despite a quiet second half and a touchdown as well. For Oklahoma, the true freshman Caleb Williams had a very nice show on coming in in the second half. 212 yards for two touchdowns. Kennedy Brooks led the charge on the ground. 25 carries for 217 yards and a pair of touchdowns as well. And then Marvin Mims, the spectacular wide receiver you saw his catch earlier in that reel. Five receptions for 136 yards and two touchdowns. Texas goes on to take on number 12 Oklahoma State at home this Saturday. And Oklahoma takes on TCU back at home this Saturday as well. For more on Saturday's unforgettable game, we go to our very own Clark Dalton. It was a great game, but the wrong ending for the Texas Longhorns on Saturday. This one hurts. That's what sport's about. You know, when you play a tight game and a rivalry game, uh, it hurts. After storming out of the gates with the 28-7 lead, past problems plagued the Longhorns. This included only giving Bijan Robinson the ball nine times in the second half and failing to change a three-man rush. Caleb Williams and Kennedy Brooks transformed Oklahoma from a stagnant offense to the old team that dominated the Big 12 with Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield. I'm proud of everybody on this team, man. You know, like I said, we played hard to the very last drive, and that's all you can ask for, you know. We came up short. Um, I mean, just, just improve on the things we need to improve on. It feels like the same story over and over again. But in some ways, it wasn't. Where past Texas teams folded, this one gave it their all to the bitter end. A 261-yard performance from freshman Xavier Worthy is all the proof you need. That makes losses like this sting even more because one team deserved to win. However, the cusp of greatness slipped through their fingers. No way I was going to let anything take me out of this game. Um, until they carted me off, so I was going to continue to battle. Even old Sooner grades admired the hearts of the Burn Orange because they know something special burns inside this team, and one day it's going to escape. 
That's why Bijan vows to pick up his sword and ride into battle one more time. We, we're not a team to back down. Um, we understand that we still got a whole season left. Uh, and, you know, we got to capitalize on every game that we play. And, you know, Lord willing, you know, we do see them at the end of the season. You see, right now in the world of college football, Texas is on one mission. They're a battering ram trying to break a wall of water, a water that's a crimson sea. Now, it didn't break down today, but that wall began to show its cracks. And one day, that crimson sea will part. Reporting from the Cotton Bowl, Clark Dalton, CSTV Sports. Thank you very much for that, Clark. Great work as always. I am now joined here by our football analyst, Adam Ogburn. Adam, thank you for joining us. Yeah, good to be on, Jason. Just wish it was in a little bit better circumstances. <laughs> Don't we all? Anyway, first question, what plays do you think truly turn the tide in this game? Quite the comeback for Oklahoma. Yeah, honestly, I think at 38-20 at halftime, you know, even the most confident Texas fans are still feeling a little bit nervous. We've watched this uh, several times, I think. Uh, but, you know, Texas – you go uh, look at the second half. The teams traded punts and field goals to kind of start the second half. So, you know, Texas still had an 18-point lead. But I think one of a really underrated play in this game was the long Kenny Brooks run. Happened with about two minutes left to go in the third quarter. It's a 65-yard run. You can see he's heading down the field. Deshaun Jameson looks like he strips it out. And it's going to be recovered by B.J. BJ Foster. Then the officials go back to it. They ruled his knee down. Oklahoma goes on to score on the next play. A 14-yard touchdown pass to Marvin Mims. Mims was a thorn on the side. He had that 52-yard touchdown pass. Caleb Williams uh, getting free, and then Mims really just somehow getting away uh, from uh, Darian Dunn to come down with the improbable catch, toe tapping along the sideline. That happened on third and 19. You can't allow that. A two point conversion that ties up the game at 41. And then, really, the nail in the coffin for Texas was the next play, the ensuing kickoff return. Xavier Worthy takes it, you know, six, seven yards deep out of his own end. So, Texas had been taking fair catches most of the day. Worthy, he's not in the main return guy. That's normally reserved for Deshaun Jamison. But Worthy takes it out of his own end zone. He's stripped of the ball. Oklahoma recovers deep in Texas territory. They go on to score on a Candy Brooks run from there. And then, Texas was always playing from behind until. That final touchdown by Candy Brooks, eventually giving the Sooners the win. Yeah, absolutely. Oklahoma came up with the big plays and they needed them the most. And, you know, can't really fault Oklahoma for being excited about that win. Now let's focus a little more on the negative from the mm -hmm. Texas side. What do you think went wrong for Texas, Texas specifically down the stretch? Yeah, I think for Texas, this game was honestly lost on both lines, both offensive and defensive. Offensive, you know, B. John Robinson only rushed for 35 yards in the second half. 33 of those came on one play. He just didn't have any room to operate. Christian Jones, left tackle. He's the blindside blocker uh, for Casey Thompson. He was the lowest rated uh, player on the field for the Longhorns by Pro Football Focus. Andres Karras, he's a true freshman at right tackle. He struggled. Jake Majors, the center, had a couple of snap infractions, full start. So overall, the offensive line struggled, uh, and that really shut down uh, the Texas running game. And then the passing game, Casey Thompson under a lot of pressure. He was sacked uh, in the second half, and then just a couple of incompletions come from that pressure. I think if you look now across to the defensive line, Caleb Williams from Oklahoma had all day. You go to that 52-yard touchdown catch by Marvin Mims, and Williams had five or six seconds to kind of stay in the pocket and eventually step up before throwing that pass. He wasn't sacked in the second half, so Texas really needed to get pressure on Williams. They didn't do that. They allowed the true freshman to settle in, and he absolutely took them apart. And then you go on that. Uh, to the you know secondary level and missed tackling was an issue too. Kenny Brooks, 217 rushing yards, 177 of those came after contact. Missed tackles played a large role in this game. You go back to the first half, Caleb Williams' first snap on that faith, faithful fourth and one at their own 34. Jaron Thompson has a chance to tackle him behind the line of scrimmage. He can't do it. Williams slips three and the rest of history. And in the secondary, you look to some 50-50 balls that you thought Texas could have maybe dealt with a little bit better. There was a minute into the fourth quarter, Caleb Williams kind of lobbed the pass off his back foot towards Mims. Uh, B.J. Foster was on the coverage, but Mims was able to kind of wrestle Foster off him and come down with the catch. It was a really floated pass. You would have expected maybe Foster to do a little bit better there and then just that freak touchdown laid on uh, by Marvin Mims where he's able to just kind of fend off Darian Dunn and somehow get a foot in for the score. So you look, you know, secondary tackling was an issue, but I think really this game was lost on both lines for the Longhorns. 
and a heartbreaking loss in that, but still six games to go. Mm -hmm. The Big 12 championship race is wide open. So what can Texas take away from this game? Where will they go from here with a big matchup against undefeated Oklahoma State at home next week? Yeah, for sure. I think it's important to remember, Texas still controls their own destiny after this game. You know, Oklahoma, as far as the Longhorns went out, they'll be at least one of the top two teams in the Big 12. So they're very still much in control of whether they can reach Arlington in December. Xavier Worthy had a big game in this one. Nine catchers for 261 yards, two touchdowns. And those two touchdowns were huge. You can see this first one here, very first play from scrimmage, breaking free down the sideline, a 75-yard touchdown, a screen pass, and then obviously he had the late touchdown, too, which ended up tying the game before that fateful Oklahoma drive. So Casey Thompson, too, another big game from him, 388 yards passing, five touchdowns. That was big. He looked a little bit shaky against TCU. I think some of that was the pressure. Again, um, the offensive line struggling to hold up blocks for him. But this was a big performance from him. His dad went to Oklahoma. So this was a statement game showing that he is the man to lead Texas forward. I think B. John Robinson in the run game will be okay. He just had nowhere to go in the second half, but when he got into space, he looked explosive. So Texas just needs to continue creating running lanes for him to go. But, you know, these next three games, this is really going to determine whether Texas gets to Arlington or not. As you mentioned, you got undefeated Oklahoma State coming to town next week. Then you got a game against a very interesting Baylor side. They've been a lot better than I thought they were. Jerry Bohannon had a big game uh, last week, 336 yards and four touchdowns this past Saturday as they blew apart West Virginia 45-20 and then a tough trip up to Ames. I know the Cyclones haven't been as good as we maybe expected this year, but Brees Hall and Brock Purdy, you can never count them out. So three big games. The Texans can get those problems solved and they can create room for B. John Robinson to run and then get pressure on Sanders, Bohannon, and Purdy, the three upcoming quarterbacks. I think the Longhorns will put themselves in a good spot to maybe be facing these Sooners again in Arlington in December. Sure hope so, Adam. Thank you, as always, for joining us. When we return, we are going to take it to the pitch and see what Texas soccer was able to do this weekend. You certainly won't want to miss it. We will be right back. Welcome back into College Press Box. On Friday, Texas soccer faced off against Iowa State looking to protect their unbeaten record in Big 12 Conference play. Let's take a look at how the Longhorns were able to fare against the Cyclones. Early on in the first half, Iowa State, or Texas make that with the scoring opportunity with big save by Iowa State. Iowa State then on the way back a couple minutes later, huge save there by Texas. Late in the first half, Lexi Misomo and the Longhorns looking to get on the board for the first time all game. Misomo would cash in with her eighth goal on the young season, making it one to nil. Start of the second half, Texas looking for a little insurance, and they would get that as well with the goal to make it two to nothing. That's how the score would finish. Texas staying unbeaten in conference play. Well, thank you for that, Jason. And now we're going to talk to our special guest, Chloe. Chloe, let's talk a little bit about some Longhorn soccer. The Longhorns have been hot all year long collectively. Who would you say individually has been most impressive for this squad so far? Personally, I have to say freshman, freshman forward, Trini Tobias. She's leading the team with goals in this season in a second in assists, having a game-winning goal against Sanford and assisting also the game-winning goal against Oklahoma. Her offensive play has really helped Texas in these close games against tough opponents. It's one of the biggest reasons why Texas is 4-0 with one tie in conference play. This freshman has proven to be one of the best players on this team, and Texas should be lucky to have such a great player. Now, obviously, despite the success, we have seen some weaknesses on this team. What players would you say need to continue to improve to make this season just a little bit better? Yeah, players have to stay improve. I mean, especially it's all of the upperclassmen. Right now, the team is being led by two freshmen, which is Trinity Byers and Lexi Massimos. When it comes down to bracket play and harder teams, these freshmen are going to need their upperclassmen to help them and guide them, especially through games like Baylor and West Virginia, which they do have coming up. The Fords like McKenzie McFarland and Sydney Nobles have to step up in these bigger games and help spread out the offense more because these teams are going to take out Byers and Massimos because they combine for the most, they combine for more half the goals this season. If they want to win the championship game and go far and back and play, these upperclassmen have to step up. These freshman team, these freshmen have never experienced college championship and bracket play. The pressure is more high and a lot more is at stake. It's easy to get caught up in all, especially for these freshmen. 
Well, yeah, that goes to so for any sport, as we saw earlier with football and now with soccer, those, those bright lights really shine on these young players. Texas. So the Longhorns are now 4-0-1 in conference play, like you mentioned thus far. What do they need to keep doing to keep on winning against Big 12 opponents? Like I said, these upperclassmen have to step up. Freshman Trini Byers and Alexi Macios are playing amazing, and Coach Angela Kelly might have to keep using them. They have tough games, like I said, coming against Baylor and West Virginia, and these teams are going to try to take out these two great freshmen. That's where your upperclassmen come in and play. This defense needs to continue playing strong, allowing only 14 goals in their games, with their most coming from a very tough opponent of UCF with four goals being scored in that game. I would also love to see this offense being spread out instead of Misimos and Byers just scoring all the goals. Well, absolutely thank you for that, Chloe, and we're looking forward to the rest of play, Big 12 play with women's soccer. But coming up next, when we come back, our very own Zach Geck will take you through the highlights from the NFL this past week, and you won't want to miss it. We'll be right back on College Press Box. Welcome back to College Press Box Now. We're going to pass it over to Zach Geck, who's got the best from a loaded NFL slate this past Sunday. Zach, take it away. Thank you, Tommy. Well, the NFL had many crazy games this weekend, and they all finished in crazy ways. First off, let's take it to L.A. Kareem Hunt gets the catch, and he's going all the way for 15 yards, plus the face mask penalty. Second down, Baker Mayfield hands to Nick Chubb, and he's going to go through the defense, and he's finally dragged down by Joshua Kelly. Now on second and three, going back to the ground game, Kareem Hunt takes it in for six, and the Browns take the lead 42 to 35. But early MVP hopeful Justin Herbert has the ball, and he rolls out, and he's going to find Keenan Allen for a nice leaping grab all the way down. To the 35. First and 10 Chargers. Herbert again. This time he's going to find Guyton. He's going to carry tacklers for another first down, carrying them all the way down to the 10. Second down. The screen to Eckler. Eckler's going to follow his tacklers and he's going to spin all the way into the end zone for six, and only needing a PAT to tie the game. However, on the PHC, Viscano misses, and the Browns are going to stay in the lead by one. Luckily for the Chargers, they get the ball back with just two minutes left. Herbert to Jared Cook, and he's going to go down the sideline for a 29-yard gain, setting them up here first and goal. Eckler being patient, the Browns are going to pull him into the end zone so they have enough time for themselves to score. Now. They're going to go for two here to take a touchdown lead, and Eckler's going to get it, and he's going to dive into the end zone. They lead by a touch by five. Now, last play of the game for the Browns. Baker Mayfield, Hail Mary attempt. He doesn't get it. The Chargers are going to hold on at home. Now, Mac Jones tied with the Texans 22 apiece in the fourth quarter. A deep ball downfield. Should have been intercepted, but good defense by the receiver, Nikhil Harry. Now, there was a penalty for roughing the passer, so this drive would stay alive, keeping them in the game. Third down, Mac Jones. He's going to find Hunter Henry for the first down, keeping the drive alive. Second down, Bolden to the left, evading tacklers, and he's going to take it down for a 24-yard gain. First down again. Running it again, Ramadre Stevenson, the former OU running back, and he's close to another first down. Okay, third and goal. Bolden takes the Wildcat snap, tries to get into the end zone and fight in, but he only gets a yard, setting up the kicker. They tried to ice him, but Nick Folk has ice in his veins, and he makes the field goal, making it 25-22 Patriots. Davis Mills and the Texans with the comeback efforts. Mills finding Conley, trying to throw it back in a lateral attempt, but the Patriots are all on top of it. They're swarming it. They have it, and the Patriots hold on 25-22.
All right, action. Sam Darnold leading by five against the Philadelphia Eagles, and he misses the pass to Robbie Anderson. The Panthers are going to have to punt, but Charlton, the punt is going to be blocked by TJ Edwards, and the Eagles fall on top of it, and they have it at the Carolina 27. Great field position for this upcoming drive. Jalen Hurts is going to have the ball to try to take the lead. Here he goes, Jalen Hurts dropping back, throwing a pass to Dallas Goddard, and Dallas Goddard has it inside the 10. It's going to be first and goal for the Eagles. Going right back to him, Dallas Goddard, and he drops a would-be walk-in touchdown. Could have had another score on his fantasy sheet, but Jalen Hurts fakes the handoff, says he doesn't need Dallas Goddard to score, and he walks in himself, and they take a lead by one point. Now they want to go by, they want to go for two because they don't want to just be leading by two. They want to lead by a field goal. Bad snap. Almost sacked, bad blocking, but he finds the Heisman winner, Devontae Smith, in the end zone. The two-point conversion is good. Now, Sam Darnold trying to come back, and Steven Nelson picks that off on the sideline. His third interception of the game for Sam Darnold. And the Eagles are going to hold on on the road, 21-18 for the win. Now, in Minnesota, third down, trying to run out the clock and is fumbled, and Reese Mabin has it, and he falls on it at the Minnesota 21-yard line to set up excellent field position for the potential game-winning drive for the Lions. The Lions, 0-4, looking for their first win. Second down, empty backfield. Jared Goff fires to Amon Ross St. Brown for the first down. Setting them up here, first and goal. Needing a touchdown. Handing the ball off to DeAndre Swift and he goes in for six. The Lions down by one. They don't want to go for the tie. They want to go for the win. They're 0-5, everybody. So Jared Goff takes it in his own hands, throwing to the back of the end zone, finding Hodge, and the Lions actually might win a game this year. But unfortunately for Lions fans, Kirk Cousins has the ball with 30 seconds left. Kirk Cousins, he's gonna drop back. He's gonna fire a bomb down the field to Thielen. Only had two catches on the night, but both of them on this drive and both of them very clutch. Next throw, Kirk Cousins right to Thielen, right near the field goal line. And they're gonna have to run up to the line to clock the ball down for a 54-yard attempt. Greg Joseph, it was right down the middle, and the Vikings win the game 19 to 17. Now in Cincinnati, Joe Burrow handing the ball off, and they don't get the first down. It's gonna be fourth and short, setting the rookie kicker Evan McPherson up for a 57-yard field goal. The kick looks good, but it's off the right, upright, and it's no good. The game stays tied, and Aaron Rodgers takes over. Aaron Rodgers takes the snap, dropping back, throwing down the field, and finding Devontae Adams. That's that man inside the 35. That's going to set them up for an attempt from their kicker, Mason Crosby, to potentially take the lead, running up. Clocking the ball with just three seconds left. No time for any other plays other than the kick in regulation. Here he is, 51 yards. Can he do it? Can he win the game? No, he cannot. It's another missed field goal. We are headed to overtime. Free football, everybody. First play of overtime. Joe Burrow takes the snap. Throwing it up the middle, right into the linebacker's hand, and Campbell is going to return it for 13 yards, setting up the Packers pretty nicely. Now, the Packers did not need a touchdown here, only needed a field goal to win, giving it right back to Crosby, and what is he going to do? He's going to miss it again. It's a tough time for the kickers on Sunday. Now, the ball goes back to Burrow with another chance. Third down. Throwing down the sideline, and was that a catch? 
At first, they ruled it a no catch, but upon review, they overturned the call on the field. You see he gets one toe in here, drags the other foot down, and that is going to be a completion from the LSU, former LSU quarterback to the former LSU receiver in Cincinnati, Jamar Chase. Still tied at 22 apiece. Third down, Joe Mixon. Joe Mixon gets close to the first down, but just doesn't quite get there. Can the kicker be the hero today? Evan McPherson, his kick is no good. It's off the flag. He thought he made it. He was celebrating early until he found out that, in fact, he did not make the field goal. Third down, Aaron Rodgers going to drop back. He's going to look, and he's going to find Randall Cobb. The former receiver comes back, and he has it right near the first down marker. All right, will a kicker win the game today? Will a kicker make a kick today? He's missed two already, and he finally makes the kick. The Packers win against the Bengals 25-22. to all right, thank you, everybody. That's going to be it for this week's segment of Unhooked. Back to you guys, Tommy. Thank you very much for joining us, Zach. When we return, we will take a look at Friday night's high school football game between Westlake and Bowie. You will not want to miss it. We'll be right back. Welcome back into College Press Box. On Friday night, Westlake and Bowie squared off in a highly anticipated showdown. We are going to send it over to our very own Matt Marinchak, who is in attendance for the action. The Bowie Bulldogs took on the Westlake Chaparros on Friday night in a rivalry matchup of the 5-0 teams. Westlake is coming off back-to-back -back state championships and is looking to go for the 3 peat later this year. Much of their success can be credited to the play of their five-star quarterback, Kate Klubnick. The thing about Cade is uh, he's one of those quarterbacks, one of those athletes that's never satisfied. He's always working his craft. You know, uh, he's got all the accolades that anybody could have in high school football, and um, he keeps working. I, I just wish everybody could be a fly on the wall and watch at about 5.30 on a Tuesday and Wednesday morning and watch this kid lead our football team and work his craft to continue to get better, and I'm, I'm so proud of him. I think he's the best quarterback in the country, and. Uh, you know, he's, he's just a guy that's not going to stop working, and that's what makes him so good. So, uh, you know, I'll always find something to, to improve on in his game. But he's a, he's a great, great player and a great person. Club Nick was off to a great start with 205 yards of total offense and two touchdowns. But that was before things took a sudden turn. After losing star quarterback Cade Klubnik to injury, Westlake's offense continued to roll, and Coach Dodge reflected on how that's going to affect his team going forward. We will stand up in, in his absence, and we will have his back. Our offensive line, our running backs, we had a couple running backs, had over 100 yards rushing, uh, ran the ball well, and, and did what we needed to do to win the game against a very good Bowie team. Westlake looks to continue their momentum next week against Hayes. From Chaparral Stadium, I'm Matt Marinchek, TSTV Sports. The top-ranked Texas volleyball team picked up two more wins in Big 12 play, but not without some trouble, as they narrowly edged out Kansas last Friday three sets to two. The Jayhawks are the only team this season to win two sets against the Longhorns. However, Texas bounced back the next day to defeat the Jayhawks in three straight sets. They stay undefeated, and they keep that number one spot. They'll continue conference play this Thursday and Friday as TCU comes into town. Texas softball picked up a pair of wins of their own over the weekend on Friday. The Longhorns beat Grayson College 22 to nothing in eight innings, while on Saturday wasn't as easy, but Texas improved to 4 and 0 with a 7 to 4 win over Texas State. The Longhorns' next game will come on Sunday in a massive showdown against Texas A&M. The Longhorns baseball team released their fall ball schedule last Thursday with their first action coming against San Jacinto College on October 24th, followed by McLennan Community College on October 31st, both games at home and at 1 p.m. You can catch that game against McLennan Community College on the Longhorn Network. Men's Swim and Dive recorded their first win of the season on Friday against Incarnate Word. Texas totaled 13 event wins in the team victory and will return to action against Texas A&M on Friday. Let's take a look ahead into the week in Longhorn Sports. 
On Thursday, the volleyball team hosts TCU for their first of two games. And on Friday, they'll play that second game against each other. You can watch them both on the Longhorn Network at 7 p.m. Also on Friday, soccer travels to Waco to play against Baylor. That game also starts at 7, and you can watch it on ESPN+. Saturday, football hosts Oklahoma State, and it's another 11 a.m. kickoff at DKR. But you can watch that on Fox as well if you don't want to die in the heat. And finishing out the week, the softball team heads to College Station for a rivalry game against Texas A&M. That one starts at 2 p.m. And with that, that is going to be all for us tonight here on College Press Box. For all of those in studio, and especially our people in Master Control, we say thank you. I'm Jason Kanander. He's Tommy Yarish. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great night.